Come on in, uh, special guest. Uh, let's, uh, let's give him a warm welcome. Silicon Valley has got some special technology to bring the past into the present. He's an ancient marvel of shield. <laughs> was your time travel to your right? It was fine. It worked fine. All right, the young oversnapper will now take you the stage. Oh, pardon my impoliteness. I should be taking my hat off indoors. <laughs> That's called a microphone. <laughs> the wires? Where are the wires? We're all wired now. <laughs> <laughs> when I heard of the 40th anniversary for Poetry Center San Jose, I knew I had to wrangle an invitation. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Pesich, Poetry Center board, the members, History San Jose. And I am just so very pleased that this organization has retained its vitality over these 40 years. And I am so pleased to the point of ghost tears <laughs> that my former home has been used for things poetic at its old location on 8th Street and here in this lovely setting at History Park. When uh, it wasn't always uh, when my mother was okay with me going into literature and teaching and writing. At first she was against it. I was the youngest of the family. She wanted me to run the farm up in Lagoon Valley, up north of here. But I was adamant. We butted heads. When I was 16 years old, I ran away from home. She had me tracked down. But I came back with a promise that she was relenting and would let me study in these fields. So I began my studies up in that area, and then she decided that she would sell the farm up there, come down to San Jose, and buy a house for her to live in, for me to live in, while I was continuing my studies at the San Jose San Jose Normal School. I imagine it has developed a little bit since then. It may be even up to four or five buildings or a couple hundred students, maybe so. But uh, I had many uh, fond memories of being in that house and moments of terror when I was studying for examinations. But uh, many years later, I was when I was married to my lovely third wife, Anna. <laughs> and we were at an art exhibit in San Francisco. There was a collection of paintings owned by Mary Crocker, the wife of Charles Crocker, one of those rubber barons. I was really taken by that one painting. The man with the hoe, by the French painter Jean-Francois Millet. I must have sat there for two hours staring at it, wondering at what was going on in his mind, what uh, the posture in his body, what people had put him in this place for this backbreaking, never-ending work. So finally, Anna tapped me on the shoulder and said, we have to catch the last ferry across the bay. We were living in Oakland at the time, so we did that. But in the ensuing days, I sat down and I wrote a poem in response to this painting. 
And that poem was published in the San Francisco Examiner in early 1899. And it caused quite a stir, locally in this area, but across the country also, and eventually even overseas. So I would like to present that poem to you now. I have a few small revisions, very slight revisions. Uh, and I will recite part of it, but I will read part of it too, because after all, I am nearly 166 years old. <laughs> and now for my spectacles. The man with the hoe. Bowed by the weight of centuries, he leans upon his hoe and gazes on the ground, the emptiness of ages in his face, and on his back the burden of the world. Who made him dead to rapture and despair, a thing that grieves not and that never hopes, stolid and stunned, a brother to the ox. Who loosened and let down this brutal jaw? Whose was the hand that slanted back this brow? Whose breath blew out the light within this brain? Is this the thing the Lord God made and gave to have dominion over sea and land? to trace the stars and sense the heavens for power, to feel the passion of eternity? Is this the dream he dreamed who shaped the suns and made their ways upon the, the ancient deep? Down all the stretch of hell to its last gulf, there is no shape more terrible than this more tongued with censure of the world's blind greed, more filled with signs and portents for the soul, more fraught with menace for the universe. O oh, masters, wrong page. <laughs> what gulfs between him and the seraphim, slave of the wheel of labor, what to him are Plato and the Pleiades? What the long reaches of the peaks of song, the rift of dawn, the reddening of the rose? Through this dread shape, the suffering ages look. Time's tragedy is in the aching stoop. Through this dread shape, humanity betrayed, plundered, profaned, and disinherited, cries protest to the powers that made the world, a protest that is also prophecy. O oh, masters, lords, and rulers in all lands, is this the handiwork you give to God? This monstrous thing distorted and soul quenched? How will you ever straighten up this shape? Touch it again with immortality. Give back the upward looking and the light. Rebuild in it the music and the dream. Make right the immemorial infamies, perfidious wrongs, immedicable woes. O oh, masters, lords, and rulers in all lands, how will the future reckon with this man, with the woman who toils alongside, with the children who learn this as their fate? How answer their brute questions in that hour when whirlwinds of rebellion shake all shores? How will it be with kingdoms with the barons and their kings, with those who shape them to the thing they are, when this dumb terror shall rise 
to judge the world after the silence of the centuries. Thank you. May I You're not done with me yet. Oh. May these words and those like it be a clarion call to those in power who would abuse that power against the helpless and an encouragement to those with little or no power and to their advocates who are just trying to help them build a life with dignified work leisure, and a hopeful future. The spirits of the poets, the artists, the musicians, the storytellers are always with us. They speak to all of the creative people of this day. Let the, uh, the words of the past be remembered let the voices of today always be heard. And I'll finish now with an excerpt from another one of my poems called The Crowning Hour. If this is a dream, then perhaps our dreaming will touch life's height to a finer fire. Who knows but the heavens in all their seeming, were made by the heart's desire. One thing shines clear in the heart's sweet reason. One lightning over the chasm runs. That to turn from love is the world's one treason that darkens all the suns. Carry on, my friends. Mm -hmm.